Welcome to the Talent Optimization Podcast, the go-to podcast for CEOs and HR professionals wanting to bridge the gap between the strategy and tactical implementation of talent optimization within their organizations. Through interviews, predictive index, and personal experience, your host, Tracy Shirk, helps you discover the facets of talent optimization from both a CEO and HR perspective to truly create the dream team for your organization. Are you ready? Let's get started. Why do you stay in your current job at your current employer? This is one of those key questions that has been asked so many times over the last year as we talk about the great resignation, the great retention, and all the things that surround that. Welcome to the Talent Optimization Podcast. My name is Tracy Shirk, and today we're really going to be digging into this concept of what inspires us to stay in our current organization. We're going to look at some of the data around it and key framework that we use when we're talking with leaders inside of organizations about how do we create an environment that inspires individuals to stay. And this will really set us up for the next two weeks. Next week, we have the HR director that was integral in changing the culture inside of an organization along with her leadership team. Then the following week, we'll have an employee inside of that organization that actually left and came back sharing a little bit about why he left, why he came back, and what keeps him engaged in his specific work every single day. So with that, let's go ahead and dig in. So here's a hint, right? And that is there are four key drivers to individuals being inspired in their work, and that is the job. Individuals have a fit to the role, so we are putting a round peg into a round hole and a square peg into a square hole, right? We are not putting a round peg into a square hole. The next is the manager. How is that manager inspiring us? I don't know about you, but the jobs that I loved and wanted to stay in for quite some time were the jobs where that manager saw me bigger than I saw myself. I had trust with that manager and that manager had trust with me. Now, as soon as that manager changed, you know what? Everything changed with that. Sometimes for the better, sometimes not. The third driver that we have to inspiring people to perform is really what is that team? How have we created that team so that we have the right team together to really support each other and build each other up? Every single one of us has amazing, amazing strengths. And we put a team together so that we are playing to each other's strengths, right? So your weakness is my strength and my weakness is your strength. Guess what? We can divide and conquer those things to really move items forward so much faster. And then the next is the organization. What is that organization, that culture that we're working in? And this is key. We have organizations that we work with where, you know what? The fit to role is amazing. The managers are amazing. The teams are amazing. But the organizational culture is dragging everything else down. So when we're inspiring people to perform, we need to take a look at these four key drivers in order to really do that. You know, and our goal today and every week when you listen into our podcast is that there is one thing that kind of trips that light bulb inside your head, right? That you can easily implement and that makes your life better, the life of your employees in your organization better. So I hope that you find that today and I trust that you will as we dig throughout this. One of the things that I do want to point out is if you look and say, hey, I want to know more about these four kind of driving factors here. We do have a free assessment that you can take called the predictive index. And this looks at who you are. Once you know who you are, we can match that to what the job needs, what the team needs, and what the organization needs. So we're talking about how we inspire individuals to perform. And so often that is specifically measured through engagement. And we've talked in the past about what engagement is. And I just want to do a quick reminder before we dive in today. So we've got some giants, right? So quantum workplace defines engagement as the strength of the mental and emotional connection employees feel towards their places of work. Gallup defines engagement as 
Engaged employees are those who are involved and enthusiastic about and committed to their work and workplace. Willis Towers Watson states engagement is employees' willingness and ability to contribute to the company's success. And Hewitt states that employee engagement is a level of an employee's psychological investment in the organization. And what we say so often here at Elevated Talent Consulting is engagement is that difference between the want to curve and the have to curve, right? So if you have employees coming to work because they have to for a paycheck, right? Guess what? The pay is not necessarily a driver or a motivator, right? That is something that individuals have to have. What we're looking at when we inspire people to perform is we're looking at those things that engage them, that light them up, the trust, the being able to be fulfilled in their work, the ability to make an impact in those individuals that they're serving and those clients that they're serving. And that gets us to the want to curve. When we put a team together where that team is so committed to each other because we know that one plus one doesn't equal two necessarily in this situation, it's 11, right? And when we look at that, we see, oh my gosh, we put this team together and they are lifting every other single person up. And that is where we see engagement. So as we look at some trends, Sherm in 2017 really talked about the biggest driver in engagement was successful, respectful treatment of all employees at all levels, followed by compensation, trust with the manager and the leadership team, then feeling safe in your work environment and the ability to use skills and abilities in your work. So right there, guess what? We just cover those four drivers of engagement and how we inspire individuals, which was the organization, the manager, the team, and fit to role within the job. So when we look at the impact of an individual being engaged versus an individual being disengaged, does this specifically matter? And one of the things that I love about Sherm is they will put out these fancy little charts. And they have a fancy little chart on engaged behaviors versus disengaged behaviors. So let's look at them. The engaged employee has a behavior of being optimistic, and the disengaged employee has a behavior of being pessimistic, right? They're absolute opposites. So we're also looking at that and saying, what other behaviors are there? So I'm just going to read the list of engaged, then I'll read the list of disengaged here. Engaged are optimistic. They're team-oriented. They go above and beyond. They are solution-oriented. They're selfless. They show a passion for learning. And they pass along credit, but they accept the blame that comes to them. Individuals that are disengaged typically are afraid of something. There's some sort of fear that they're trying to protect right? And this is how those, those drives show up in the behaviors. The pessimistic, self-centered, high absenteeism, negative attitude, egocentric. They focus on monetary worth and they accept credit, but they pass along the blame to others. So when we look at this and we say, hey, how do we inspire others? One of the first things to look at is ourselves and say, hey, are we engaged in our work? As the executives running your organizations and the business owners listening in today, and as the HR professionals, I first and foremost want to say, where do you see yourself in this specific list? Do you see yourself on the engaged side or do you see yourself on the disengaged side? Because guess what? You are looked up to, you are replicated, and you are seen as leaders inside of your organization. Yes, I'm talking to you, the HR assistant who's been in your role for six weeks, right? You're still in a seat inside the organization that you are seen as a leader. And this goes all the way up to the business owner and to the CEO. And how we show up to work every day has a significant impact on those around us. And this impacts, guess what, the organizational culture. So with that being said, when we're inspiring folks to perform, when we are looking at how are individuals engaged in their work, because guess what? If we're not engaged in our work, we're probably not going to hit the business outcomes that our organizations need and that our clients expect. So we really need to take a look at this and say, 
where are we in all of this? And once we know where we are firmly seated, we can say, hey, what do I need to change for me so that we can change this for the entire organization if needed? And the flip side of this is what's going really well. And let's celebrate that. So often we're focused on the negative things that aren't going well, that we're not celebrating the things that are going well. If you have a team in your organization that is clicking on all cylinders, thank them for that. I will tell you that we have a team together inside of Elevated Talent right now that is clicking and it's amazing what we can get done and how we're serving our clients to such a high level. So with that being said, celebrate those successes. Now let's do a circle back around to those four drivers that we talked about at the beginning. And that is, as we look at our organization, do we have the right people in the right seats? And this is the alignment to the job. And a lot of times when we chat with clients and prospects in organizations, we're specifically looking at something called a fit gap analysis. Who's a fit to their role? Who's not a fit to their role? And it's not necessarily a bad thing if they're not a fit to their role, But what are those slight changes that can potentially be made that are going to best serve the organization and best serve the individuals inside of that specific role? The next is, hey, how are your leaders, your managers, supporting their direct reports? And guess what? Management is not a skill that we you know, are born with. Leadership is not a skill that we are born with. It is something that is learned. And are you supporting your managers to really lead their staff the way they need to be led, right? This distinction between the platinum rule and the golden rule. The golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. And the platinum rules, treat others the way they want to be treated. The way I want to be managed may not and probably is not the way my manager wants to be managed or needs to be managed. So it's something we really have to take a close look at and say, hey, what do we need to do with this? And you know what? It doesn't necessarily have to be hard, especially when you have an easy button where you can look at this and say, ah, this is what this person needs. And it's as simple as asking them, what is it that they need? And then when you're having your monthly conversations, to follow up and say, all right, how am I doing leading you the way you need to be led? Here's things that went really well this month. Here's some things that maybe didn't go so well, right? Because guess what? Good leadership is not being Pollyanna. It's not being positive all the time. It's naming what is so and loving on people so much that they know exactly where they stand and how to move forward in a motivating way so that they can meet their highest potential. And so can you as their leader and the organization. So, and then we're going to talk about the team. Guess what? As a team, we can succeed or we can fail if we're all competing against each other. And what happens when we start competing against each other is we start poking at weakness after weakness after weakness, and we're no longer playing to our strengths. Nobody wants to work in that environment. I don't want to get up and walk into that environment. And you want to know what the litmus test for that is? How do you feel on a Sunday afternoon, right? How do you feel on a Sunday afternoon? Do you have knots in your stomach about going to work the next day? Are you like, yes, we get to accomplish something amazing this week and I can't wait, right? So ask that question to your staff. They're probably not going to tell you an honest answer if they do have knots in their stomach but at least you're dipping into and having the conversation out in the open about what you need to be successful and what does that look like? How do we support each other as a team? Because when we have the right team in place, guess what? The team rises each other up much stronger than we can do individually on our own. And then we have the organization as a whole. And these are essentially the culture, that culture that we're creating, where the organization's heading, how we're holding individuals accountable or not, right? And Brene Brown has been chatting with us for a couple of years now on authenticity and creating spaces where we have a strong back and a soft front. And what that really means is as leaders, we need to be strong in what 
it is that needs to happen, but we need to be authentic and heart-centered as far as how we connect with others, how we motivate them and sharing our stories, right? Because guess what? When we share ourselves with others, it's something that they want and need. And it shows that there's some trust there that we can build. Now there's right ways to share things and there's wrong ways, right? If you're going to share something vulnerable, make sure you're all the way through it first. You're not sharing something that you're completely in the middle of and still have some negative energy around, right? But when you can share those stories of how you worked through something and what you learned from that, you motivate others because guess what? Life is 50-50, It's not always fantastic, but it's not always crappy either. And I know you're going to walk into people that their life seems to be, you know, a craptastic show 100% of the time. It's not unless they choose for it to be, but life's not perfect all the time either. And ensuring that we can see that, especially at work and really support each other. in asking the question as to what do you really need right now? Because we never know what's going on with another person, right? I had a conversation with a really good friend this week who shared with me some things that she's going through. And guess what? They're kind of craptastic. But we were able to have a conversation and kind of just say, hey, whatever you need, just call. I don't care what it is. We can watch Disney movies and drink wine. We can laugh. We can do whatever, right? And So often it is the same thing in the workplace when you have that strong relationship on a team because you're all rallying for each other and you are doggedly committed to meeting those business outcomes. You know, as the pandemic has shown us over the last year, two years, however long it's been, you know, we've really seen the cats come across the screen. We know which cats love the screen, right? Which love the Zoom screen. We know the kiddos and the the type of cereal that they love to eat. All the things that we didn't know before, we saw the working conditions of some of our staff that were like, oh my goodness, I want those cabinets. And the others were like, how can I help? What do you need? With still showing them the empathy and when they have pride in something that happened at home, guess what? We have pride in that too. So guess what? Life and work is integrated. you know. And as my coach would say, it's all the same pot of soup. So if leaders, as leaders, we have an obligation to inspire and telling those personal stories helps lead to more trust and relationships. The research tracks three key drivers of trust. It's authenticity, logic, and empathy. And we tend to trust people who believe are acting as their real selves and demonstrating empathy. Increasing realness and humanity by sharing personal stories is one powerful way to build trust. And this is a quote from a Harvard Business Review article, and it was from Gia Store. And I love that because it's essentially sharing and showing that those personal stories as leaders, guess what? They help to motivate the staff that we're working with. And so with that... There are a couple of things that I just want to chat about with that storytelling, right? And there's a very specific recipe to that. I always want you to leave these podcasts with a couple kind of big ahas, right? The light bulb went off. And if you've had any of those so far, you know, send me an email, tell me about it, reach out, put it on the comments underneath our podcast. So there's kind of a recipe to this, right? You want to cultivate your top stories about failure, Because stories of failure help us relate, normalize setbacks, and create intimacy. Because we can connect with another person. We want to incorporate vulnerability in real time. How do you do this? You say, hey, my feeling about this is, it feels scary to share this, but, or I hesitated to bring this forward because, right? And then you can start to build that connection, And then you want to share what's on your mind, what's going on. So something that I want to share with each of you as you look at how do you engage staff inside your organization is I didn't always do this well. And there's times where I still don't do it well, right? But what I have found is when I am completely stressed out and moving way, 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 way too fast, I tend to bulldoze those individuals that are on my team or around me and I miss deadlines, right? But here's the deal. What I have learned is that when I can prioritize and ask my staff and say, hey, this is what I need help with, they are always willing to do so. 
And when we create that culture inside of our organization, it sends a message that that's okay for them to do it too. And one of the things that we have done over the last couple of months is we've set out our weekly meetings that specifically start and ground ourselves in what are our core values? How did that show up in our day-to-day working this week with our clients and with each other? You know, what's a client curveball that showed up that we just didn't know how to handle? And what are the thoughts from those around the room? Where are we at with capacity? Who needs some support? Who has some capacity that they're willing to lend that support? And then how do we all win and how do we celebrate those wins, right? So those are some of the things that we're working on that are really working to engage staff and ensure that we're providing that highest level outcome. So as we start to kind of land the plane here, what's a key actionable takeaway for our executives listening? And I really hope that you take away that authenticity and being authentic with your staff about what's going on, what's needed, and motivating in a way that is that that connection. And then for HR, you know, you want to be real and you want to be mission driven, go back to your core values. And then what specifically impacts engagement? Because there's some things that have a much stronger impact to engagement than others. And it specifically goes back to our individuals in the right role. Are they working with a manager that inspires them? And this is a two-way street, right? Do we have the right teams together to accomplish our key goals? And then is our organization aligned with the individual values? So now that we've laid that groundwork, we want to hear, you know, some stories about how this was put into action. So please come back and join us next week where we talk with the HR director with Amwood Homes. And then the following week, we will talk with an employee with Amwood Homes about how they have implemented this and really built something pretty amazing. So April and Dave have something that I think each of you will be able to hear in a way to say, ah. Now this framework that we've seen, we can see how it works inside of an organization. So with that, thank you so much for joining us and cannot wait to see you back next week. I hope you have a great week. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Talent Optimization Podcast. You'll find more tools and resources for CEOs and HR professionals looking to bridge the strategies versus implementation gap of talent optimization at elevatedtalentconsulting.com. We've also created a free, valuable resource for you to begin bridging the gap called the Talent Optimization Foundation Membership Program. You can access it for free at elevatedtalentconsulting.com forward slash foundation. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode to learn more about talent optimization and creating a dream team for your organization.